Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the How To Academy. My name is David Malone, um, and thank you very much for choosing to join us for tonight's debate about free will. And if I could point out the obvious in a debate like this, it may be, of course, that you didn't choose of your own free will to join this debate. It may be, in fact, that you had no choice in the matter at all. To help us decide whether you did or didn't choose to join us, we have two fantastic speakers this evening. Um, Robert Sapolsky is a professor of biology and neurology at Stanford University, uh, a, re a recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. I think the name is self-explanatory. And he's written a new book called Determined, Life Without Free Will. Uh, joining him, um, we have one of the world's most influential philosophers, Dan Dennett. He's Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. He's written extensively about the workings of the mind, about consciousness, and has also written about free will. And he too has a new book called I've Been Thinking. Um, and amongst other things we're going to discuss this evening will be determinism. What is it? Free will. Do we have it? And even if we do, is it what we thought it was? And if not, why not? Um, before we start, uh, there is a poll which you um, as listeners can look at, decide how many of you are on the side of free will and how many on the side of determinism. While you're deciding that, um, let me explain how it will work. Each of our speakers will have 10 minutes to convince you of their point of view. They'll then have a further 10 minutes to respond and then we'll have a discussion and some questions, and then we'll see if we'll poll you again to see if anyone's changed their mind. Um, Robert, um, Dan, thank you both very much for joining us. Um, Robert, would you um, would you like to start? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thanks for having me here, and thanks, Dan, for being here as well. So you've oh, got 10 minutes, 10 right. minutes to, to convince us of what you will. Okay, I thought we were going to be given the, uh, the polling results, but no, I guess that's a cliffhanger. Okay, so to start, uh, just to start with a very subtle nuanced stance, I think there is no free will whatsoever. Um, I think that is abundantly clear. And on top of that, um, I think if people started believing that, it would be a far more humane world. This would be a very good thing. Now, looking at the fact that people very strongly hold on to the notion of free will, I want to try to unpack one of the things that really sort of fuels that stance, which is we make decisions. We make choices. We sit there, we choose vanilla over chocolate ice cream. We choose to pull a trigger or not to do so. We are full of intent at that moment. And we make a choice. And there is something intuitively, truly seductive about that. And unpacking the choice, the intent, we know we have the intent at that point. We have a pretty good sense what the consequence is going to be. We know we're not being coerced. There's alternatives available to us and to most people and to courts of law in the United States. That's enough. You have responsibility. And my starting point is that tells us nothing whatsoever about free will. It is completely irrelevant to it. Whether we form an intent to do this or to do that, that is completely irrelevant for a very simple reason. Because assessing behavior based on that is like reviewing a movie when all you've seen is the last three minutes of the movie. Because what you're never, ever asking with that stance is, Oh, yeah? Where did that intent come from? How did you become the sort of person where that is the sort of intent you would form at that moment? Because that's really the only thing to do. It's the only question to ask. Okay, let me give you a scenario that is laden with intent and choice. You got two people. They go in, they watch a movie. The movie is some inspirational movie about some guy who previously has been obscure and now does something incredibly heroic. And the first person comes out of the movie with an intent and a choice. They say, oh my God, that was so inspirational. Right now, I'm going to go over to that booth by the popcorn stand and I'm going to sign over my life savings to Doctors Without Borders. That's how inspired I am. I intend to do that. And the second person 
has an intent and makes a choice at that point. And they says, oh my God, that was the most outrageously manipulative movie. I can't believe that script, the cinematography was terrible. I'm outraged. I'm offended that they would charge my, I'm outraged at the theater and I am going to go right now and demand my money back. Okay, so we see two people who acted with intent, made choices. And the question obviously then is, how did they become the sorts of people where those are the choices that they would make, where those are the intents they would form? And if you come from a world of biology, as I do, uh, that's a whole hierarchy of questions, because there's a whole hierarchy of things that went into each of those people intending to do what they do. Part of what was playing out in the previous minutes to hours were they angry? Were they hungry? Were they in pain? Were they sleep deprived? Were they stressed? Were they scared? Whatever, because we know people's choices will change dramatically in those circumstances. People's judgment, people's executive con control, people's capacity to make one site type of decision, if it is a tougher one, but it is more appealing in the long run. Okay, so that matters. What also matters in the previous hours to days are hormone levels, because that will have been, if you had elevated levels of oxytocin, you're more likely to be trusting of what the movie was telling you. If you had elevated levels of testosterone, you were more likely to be pissed off and perceive the movie makers as having bad intent. But you also have to ask what was going on in the previous months to decades as one example, if you had had a trauma and you now have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a structure in your brain, the amygdala will have grown larger, and we can tell you down to the molecules exactly how that works. And when you have an amygdala like that, in circumstances that other people would decide are neutral, you're going to decide is provocative and threatening. And even though we understand much less about it, the same changes, the same drama would have occurred in your brain if in the previous months of the decades, you had found love, you had found God, you had found all of that matters. Okay, so now we got to barrel back to adolescence and childhood. And I think no one needs to be convinced by now that the type of childhood you have influences the type of adult you become. What we've been learning since are the nuts and bolts, the epigenetics of how the brain you have as an adult sitting and watching that movie is going to be vastly influenced by how many traumas you had as a child, how much adversity, how much stimulation. And there's a whole world of developmental people who even have a scoring system. What is your ACE score, your adverse childhood experience score? Were you physically abused, psychologically, sexually? Were you witness to? Did you have a family member who was incarcerated? Was there somebody with a substance abuse problem? And each additional you know, score you get in that questionnaire, there's about a 35% increased chance that by young adulthood, you will have a history of antisocial violence. Childhood matters. The culture you were raised in as a child matters. Are you raised in a culture of honor? Because as an adult, you were more likely to advocate aggressive responses to ambiguous social circumstances, and you're more likely to secrete stress hormones at the time. Were you raised in an individualistic or a collectivist culture? Because that's going to influence your levels of trust and cooperation with people you don't know. Were you raised in a culture with this value, with that, to turn the other cheek, to take revenge because if they take your camel now and you do nothing, tomorrow they'll take the rest of your camels? All of this is instantiated in the brain you develop. But you got to push back even further, back to your fetal life. Because what was going on there was directing the brain and its construction that you were going to have now in that moment forming that intent in that movie theater. If, for example, you were exposed to a lot of stress hormones as a fetus because mom was stressed as hell, trying to pay the rent, being homeless, whatever, you're going to develop a larger amygdala. And as a result, you are going to have an elevated stress response, which is going to make your judgment and executive control not as effective as usual. If you were, as a fetus, deprived of calories, 
as an adult, you're more likely to form the, the intent, screw Amnesty International and screw getting my money back. I'm going to go get a lot more popcorn because you will have developed with fewer dopamine neurons in your reward area and you will have less satiation and you will be more prone towards adult onset diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, obesity, all of that because of your fetal life. Then we got to push a step further back. Genes. Genes determine next to nothing. People have to be weaned off to that notion of sort of genetic molecular fundamentalism. But what genes do is influence how you are going to respond to environment. And by now, we know we differ from one person to the next. The variants of genes we have related to hormones like oxytocin and vasopressin how able are you to have empathy? How trusting are you? How generous? Hormone genes related to your stress response. Do you see threat that other people don't? Genes related to your vulnerability to mood disorders, anxiety disorders, genes related to your propensity towards violence, depending on whether you were abused as a child or not. All of these come into it. And, and uh, one, one more thing. minute. One You've moment. got to push one step further back. Culture, where'd that come from? If your ancestors grew up in a world with a heavy infectious disease load, you're likely to be more hostile to immigration. If your ancestors grew up as shepherds, you are more likely to be aggressive than if they grew up as farmers. Where is behavior coming from? Where's responsibility coming from? It's coming from one second ago to thousands of years ago. And what we have here are a number of punchlines. The first one is history matters. The past isn't even past. And what we see over and over is the biology of why luck does not even out over time, as Dan has often said. Instead, bad luck amplifies and good luck and privilege amplifies in the opposite direction. What we also see is a realm where these are not just biological influences. If you're talking about genes, you're talking about their evolution. You're talking about the epigenetics of your fetal life that regulate them. You're talking about the proteins they made 20 minutes ago. It forms one continuous arc of biology in which there is not a crack there into which you can shoehorn free will. If it was 500 years ago and somebody said, wow, we just noticed when people get hammered over the head, their behavior changes, the brain may be relevant. That's one thing. We know a ton now. We know enough to present the challenge. Show me a brain, a person who has just done something completely independent of every one of those biological environmental influences I just outlined, and you've proven there's free will. And at this point, we know enough of this biology that the onus is on the free will believers. Unless you can show evidence of people's actions, people's behavior, people's personalities, proclivities, desires, et cetera, being independent of their biological and environmental history, you've presented no evidence that free will exists. And the only default stance there is, is to doubt that it exists, to not accept its existence. Thank you. Um, before I ask you to start, we, the, the results of the, the poll were 59% did believe in free will, 41% didn't. That's where we've started. For okay. Robert, thank you. Um, Dan, there's the challenge for you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to uh, issue a little disclaimer about your poll. You asked whether you believe in determinism or free will. I believe in both determinism and free will. <laughs> yes. And because I think that what Robert shows so eloquently is that he's been taken in by the philosophers who have inflated the idea of free will way beyond what it has to be. And he says, if if you can't point to a, an, a decision you make which is completely free of all earlier uh, uh, considerations and influences, then then you can't show free will. But that's, a, that's just a daft notion of free will. And there's a strange tension in, in, in Robert's 10 minutes there. What's he doing? Why is he talking to me? Does he think he convinced me? He can convince me or convince anybody? 
I think I can convince people, and I think he thinks he can convince people. And that's because we are both receptive to reasons. Now, I agree with everything he says about the hormonal and developmental and epistatic uh, developments that impinge on who one is at the time. That's the raw material each of us starts with, and we don't start in the same place. As he says in his book, life isn't fair. And that's true. There are tremendous differences in style, in, in talent, in accomplishment, in education, in upbringing, in nutrition. That's true. The whole point of free will is that this is a socially evolved system which minimizes those, which take steps to make the world safer for everybody. I counted on Robert being here today. I'm sure he counted on my being here. We both are reliable people. You can trust us. That's one of the key elements of free will, to be self-controlled. Now, Robert says, go back years and years and years, go back before your birth. I want to go back even further. I want to go back to the beginning of life. Because when evolution gets started, what begins is a process of skill development. The very first living things were better at staying alive and making progeny than the alternatives. And it's been a growth of skill and competence ever since. And there's skills that Robert and I have that many people don't have. And there's other skills that we don't have. I can't play the violin. I, I, I can't uh, dance the minuet. I, I can't read Persian. There's lots of things I can't do. Too bad, but I've got my own set of skills. He's got his own set of skills. And what civilization has done is to, over the centuries, over the millennia, what civilization has done is to distill out the most important skills for making people safe and reliable citizens. And that is, do they have the skill of self-control? Now, that's what evolution is all about. Evolution is about the evolution of the skill of self-control. And we are better self-controlled because we have many more degrees of freedom than any other living thing on the planet. We have a lot more skill. If a tree falls and kills somebody, we don't hold it responsible. It doesn't have the skill. It doesn't have the perceptual organs. It's not able to prevent foreseeable damages because it can't foresee, but we can. Now, he uh, the, there's a quote that I love from, from the late great uh, novelist and critic Tom Wolfe, who said, uh, uh, the conclusion people out beyond the library walls, laboratory walls are drawing is, the fix is in, we're all hardwired, that, and don't blame me, I'm wired wrong. Well, if you're wired wrong, I won't blame you, but what about being wired right? Not perfectly, but well enough to be held responsible and to hold yourself responsible. I assume Robert has a driver's license. He has self-control enough. He's, I'm not scared if he's out on the highway because I, he's basically sane and he has self-control. There are other people who shouldn't be on the highway. Now, one of the points that he makes a great deal of in his book, and it's an important one, is that we have to draw the line somewhere. Some people just miss the boat for having the kind of skill, the kind of self-control that entitles them to treat themselves as responsible agents, to make contracts, to make promises, to take care of yourself, to go free in the world. Now, we're learning every day, and Robert has a lot to say about this, ways in which people have diminished self-control, diminished capacity. And we have to recognize that 
beyond some point, and it's going to have to be arbitrary, like driver's license age, we have to say, I'm sorry, you're not responsible. You have lost your free will. It has nothing to do with determinism. It has everything to do with control. I'm getting old. I may lose my marbles one of these days, and then I'll lose my self-control. I'll lose my free will. Free will is an achievement. It's a skill. It's not a metaphysical feature. So when you understand that free will is something that has been described in some detail and with lots of improvements over the centuries by civilizations. And we've made tremendous progress. One of the things I really admire about, about Robert's book is he goes back and gives lots of detail about the horrific punishments that used to pass muster, that used to be considered all right. None of us want to live in that world. That's terrible. Look, we've made improvement. We've gotten better. We've evolved. We've arrived at a point where we don't draw on quarter people. We don't, and, and we don't need the horrific blame of guilt in the eyes of God. That's, that's a, uh, a barbarism that we can ex exclude. That's, one more minute. Yeah, one more minute, yes. <clears throat> now, I, I find myself in an odd position of saying to a biologist that he should take evolution more seriously. The, that evolution, as the title of my book, Freedom Evolves, makes clear, shows that there was no free will at all billions of years ago. And the free will has been growing and growing and growing as we become ever more capable of controlling ourselves and controlling each other and thinking about how to control ourselves and improving our methods of self-control. And there's a long way to go. And he himself has spoken about the desire to educate people and get them to see, well, he wants to say that they don't have free will. I say, they don't have the kind of free will that some philosophers say they should have, but that's not a variety of free will that anyone should, should care about. It's not, it's not worth having. I have never seen anybody explain why it would be desirable to have an undetermined will. We want our will to be determined by the facts and by our values. That's what self-control is. One thing that Robert says that I would actually invite him to, to back off on, he says at one point, it's logically indefensible, ludicrous, meaningless to think that something good can happen to a machine. I'm a machine. I'm an evolved machine made of machines, made of machines, made of machines. There's nothing magic about me, but good things can happen to me and bad things can happen to me. That's how good a machine I am. It seems to me that Robert has a secret yearning for a sort of magical power, which he realizes he can't have. Okay. No, you can have it. <laughs> uh, Robert, um, thank you, Dan. Robert, um, would you like to respond? Um, take up to 10 minutes to do so. You're muted at the moment. Unfortunately, I'm in Manhattan right now, so there's at least four fire engines <laughs> within a quarter mile radius, but that's just the norm here. Well, amazingly enough, I don't agree with everything you said, Dan, amid my greatly admiring sort of the, the eloquence with which you've argued for free will. I think there's something very interesting that you brought up that quote of mine at the end, which was saying it's ridiculous to say that anything good can happen to a machine. You didn't finish the quote where I then say, nonetheless, at my very core, I think it is a good thing when we are made to have lives with less pain and more happiness. Um, oh, so, you agree with me. Yes. Okay. So a good addendum there. Okay. So where we don't agree. Ah, 
one other thing we agree on. Both of us agree, let we, lest we get caught in the sort of mud with this, we both think punishment and reward are okay to use in an instrumental sense. Yes. So completely in agreement on that. Okay, so where we're not in agreement. And so the first issue is an interesting one in terms of what you describe sort of the evolution of. You point out, say, we do not flay people and burn them at the stake anymore. We have evolved. And in some way, I think you're equating that, that we have evolved to have more free will because you're yoking our capacity for self-control to evolution an awful lot. The fact that we don't burn people at the stake anymore, I think shows exactly the opposite, which is over and over throughout history, we have learned, ah, someone is actually not responsible for this. Somebody does not control the weather and thus deserves to be burned at the stake as a witch. Ah, somebody has an epileptic seizure, not because they're sleeping with Satan. Ah, somebody has trouble learning to read because they have dyslexia and we know the neuroanatomy of it rather than they're lazy and unmotivated. At each one of these steps where we have subtracted out responsibility, where we have viewed the world as having less free will, it's become a much nicer place to live in. Now, as a second point, sort of you're alluding to, to what I think is another incredibly like tempting, seductive way to, in which to get into trouble, which is to make this false dichotomy. Yes, most people will admit we have no control over some of the attributes that we were given, that we were gifted with, that we were cursed with, and so on. Some of us are tall, some of us have perfect pitch, some of us have good memory spans for digits, some of us this or that, and you know we were given these traits. Yeah, 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 most people will now believe rather than being Calvinists that this was outside our realm of control. What people then do is this like leapfrog over this grand canyon of a false dichotomy into, but where we have free will, is what we do with those attributes. Do we show tenacity? Do we show gumption and backbone? When the going gets tough, do the tough get going? Do we show self-control? Or conversely, are we privileged and gifted and we squander it away with self-indulgence? The seduction is that things like, oh, how good your memory span is, what type of receptor you have for this neurotransmitter relevant to memory, yeah, 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 that's stuff you were given. But what you do with it, your gumption, your control or lack thereof, that's made of fairy dust, that's magical stuff, that's a completely different category. And what we see is self-control is as biological of a trait as is your eye color as is your capacity to play the piano, as is your height. It's a different kind of biology. For my money, it's a hell of a lot more interesting biology, but it's just as biological. And what it's embedded in is a squishy, real, biologically yucky part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. You develop a good prefrontal cortex, you are going to be good at showing self-control as an adult you will be better at doing the hard thing when it's the right thing to do. Are we responsible for the sort of prefrontal cortices we have? Not a chance. Here's one example that should stop people right in their tracks, that, that should have people out, you know, yelling at the barricades and singing like revolutionary songs from Les Mis. By the time a child is five years old, the socioeconomic status of their parents is already a predictor of the thickness of their prefrontal cortex and its metabolic rate. And big surprise, it goes in the direction of if you very imprudently intended and chose to be born into a family in poverty, you're going to have a screwed up prefrontal cortex on the average by the time you're five years old. Bad luck evens out over time. Gumption is not made of biology. This is the biology, which every step along afterward is the biology and interactions with environment of why at virtually every juncture, this person is going to make the wrong decision and go in the wrong direction. And it has as little to do with choice and free will as your eye color does. 
I think the final point I want to make with that is running through that is a notion, again, the gumption angle is a source of pulling out judgment and responsibility, which I think is simply antithetical to where the science is. If we can have a quote of yours, Dan, quote, a good runner who starts at the back of the pack, if he is really good enough to deserve winning, will probably have plenty of opportunity to overcome the initial disadvantage. In other words, if he fails to show su sufficient gumption to make up for that deficit, he doesn't deserve to win. It is a moral judgment that he was not able to overcome his initial bad luck because control is made out of magic. Control is something that is not made out of biology. And I obviously strongly disagree with that. I think the very last point, Dan, is there's another realm in which I think you've been seduced into a great embrace of free will, which is you've got a lot more faith in intuition than I think is justified. For example, you have the really interesting two-stage model of decision-making, which let's not get into it, but I disagree with, blah, blah, big surprise. But you say one of its strengths is it aligns with our intuitions. Quote, that model, quote, provides some account of our important intuition that we are the authors of our moral decisions. In other words, your model for why there's some free will is more acceptable because it fits with our intuition that we have free will. And I think my last point here that I want to make is intuition is a really lousy guide for thinking about how the world works. Let me give you an example. I will bet, Dan, if you and I were sitting in a cafe 400 years ago, we were the same people and just as reflective and we would have like given money to NPR if it existed at the time and all of that, we would have been the same reasonable people. It would have been probably intuitively obvious to us that certain people are meant to be slaves. In fact, they're so incapable of taking care of themselves, it's a blessing to enslave them and feed them and clothe them. And, that, and that's not intuitively obvious to, to us anymore. It's not intuitively obvious that it's okay to have four-year-olds work in factories. But well, in the past... Well would have seemed intuitively obvious to us as well. It's no longer intuitively obvious that a kid who has a cortical malformation and as a result reverses looped letters and has trouble learning to read because of their dyslexia, it's no longer intuitively obvious to us that they're lazy and unmotivated. But 40, 50 years ago, I suspect both of us would have found it obvious that this is a kid who just really isn't paying attention, isn't motivated. Over and over and over, our intuitions have proven wrong. Over and over, when we realize our intuitions are a very poor litmus test, and we recognize we are intuitively punishing and rewarding and judging and all of that for things people had no control over, over and over when we recognize that these intuitions, in fact, are based on responsibility, which is simply not there the world becomes a better place. It really is a very good thing that we figured out witches don't control the weather, and we figured out that rotten, psychoanalytically poisonous mothers don't cause schizophrenia, and that people with a certain variant of a gene for the leptin receptor have trouble having their brains satiate rather than them just hating themselves and thus eating themselves into obesity. At every one of these steps, our initial intuitions have proven very, very suspect and wrong. And at each step, when we actually learn what's going on, we, we subtract responsibility out of it. And not only doesn't the societal roof fall in, it becomes a much better place to live in. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan, would you like to take 10 minutes I, to, yeah, to yeah, respond? Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Robert, for giving me some wonderful examples to talk about. You quote me twice, and in both cases, you ignore the fact that I reject the view that you quote. So uh, I forgive you for that, because you're not responsible. Uh, you couldn't help it. It was, your, it was the various imbalances in your brain that led you to misunderstand the quote about the, about the marathon. The very passage 
where you cite in, in your book, page, uh, what, 376 of uh, Freedom Evolves, I go on to say, but that's wrong. <laughs> I, th I say uh, that, that uh, misleads. Uh, it underplays the role of non-fortuitous breaks in the race to responsible agenthood. If you'd read the rest of the sentence, but I guess you were not, didn't have enough self-control to do that. But if you had, you would have realized that you were misquoting me. And as for the two-stage model, the whole point of that article is to say the two-stage model doesn't work. So you sort of admitted that, that I didn't endorse that model. So you found one thing that I gainsayed about it. I said, well, you know, it does meet an intuition, but I didn't on that ground support the model. In fact, I rejected the model. So, but since you don't have responsibility, I don't blame you. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little sorry. I'm a little disappointed that you don't take responsibility for these errors. I try to take responsibility for my errors, and I would hope other people would too. Um, uh, at one point you say, as we've seen, rejection of free will doesn't doom you to break bad, not if you've been educated about the roots of where our behavior comes from. I agree with that, with everything except you're taking on the definition of free will as, as being uh, incompatible with determinism, but it's not. That's what compatibilists say. We say, no, you don't need indeterminism. What you do need is chaos. You do need that squishy, uh, messy, impossible to predict goings on in your neocortex and elsewhere in your brain, because we have to be a little bit unpredictable. We have to keep our counsel. We don't want to be controlled by others. The whole key to free will is, yes, you're not responsible for becoming a free will responsible person. But once you've become one, you now have the talent to resist being turned into a puppet you can maintain your autonomy in the face of other other influences now not always but at least you know you should try and you do and i really admire the honesty of your book you acknowledge a lot of your own uh, mental imbalances that bother you and i'm saying you already agree with me that free will of the sort that I'm talking about is a desirable thing. It's what you strive for and what, to a very great degree, you achieve. You say at one point, first, it isn't free will and responsibility just because on the social level, everyone says it is. That's the central point of the book. And I'm saying, that sentence reveals that you have bought the pathetic line of those incompatibilist philosophers who insist that free will depends on indeterminism. It doesn't. It depends on randomness. Let me, let me put a question to you. Does evolution depend on indeterminism or on randomness, like a coin flip? Coin flips aren't random. They're just not controllable. They're determined. They're just not controllable. Evolution depends on the uncontrollable generation of diversity. But that doesn't, you can't prove indeterminism by citing natural selection as your proof, because natural selection works fine with deterministic chaos. Robert, do you, do you want to answer that? Yeah, very briefly. Um... This is your two-stage model, Dan, which is stage one is a generation of randomness, a chaoticism that bubbles up all sorts of options for behavior. And as you point out, filtering out the nonsense, what should I do next? Bark like a dog. That's probably not very viable, a reasonable number of them. And then stage two, you choose. You choose, you weigh them, you reflect all of that, and you choose which of those options you do. And all that does is take us back to where I started. 
how did you wind up being the sort of person where that's the choice you would make, that that's the values that you have, that that's the thing you consider to be most important? That's the same issue again. You did not choose to become the sort of person who would make that choice at that point. It's absolutely a choice at that point. And yes, I agree with your sort of chaoticism of generating options, doing a couple of filterings. Richard Dawkins has done fascinating stuff on how we filter out the nonsense of options and algorithms for doing that. We focus in on the reasonable stuff and then the sort of person that circumstances outside your control have made you chooses among the options. We're back to where I started. Absolutely. Well, well Robert, uh, you, yes, you, you and I are who we are because of that whole long history that goes back to the birth of life. But one of the wonderful things about what civilization has managed to do is to create a perspective where that doesn't matter all that much. And where, because of education, because of all the research that you and your colleagues do, we've learned how to address and counteract a lot of the effects. And where we can't counteract them, we excuse people. Some people don't have free will, but many people do have free will that they get because they have been fortunate enough to know they weren't responsible for this, but they were lucky enough to get treated for the conditions that maladapted their brains for citizenship. And I agree with you, we should do a lot more. You say at one point in your book, uh, we've got to have education. We've got to teach people what the, what the real sources of a lot of these uh, motivations are and we are doing it and we have been doing it and that's what free will is and it's only because we can do that that we can treat one group of human beings not the young children not the senile not the brain damage as capable of taking responsibility for the judgments they make and we hold them responsible, and they hold themselves responsible. Mm -hmm. And as I've said at one point, the ideal system of punishment, and I'm glad you agree with me that punishment is a necessity. You can't have a civilization without punishment, without law and order. The ideal situation, of, the circumstance of punishment is where you have a system of punishment, which is so fair and so non-awful that the person punished says, thanks, I needed that. Um, would you mind if I ask a couple of questions? And I hope my questions won't be too um, silly, but Robert, if I could put to you, if I've understood you, are you suggesting that you, you wrote this book, a big, long, tremendously interesting book. Are you saying that the book was written as the culmination of all the circumstances of your life that you didn't that none of your thoughts were in a sense willed by you that the book was written through you by the circumstances of the whole of life and yours it's a it's an odd situation but i think that's what you're saying and if if, if you're not saying that please clear up my misunderstanding oh, that's absolutely the case and that was my thinking and where i was at even before I became daft from reading philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very dangerous thing, I can tell you, yeah. I, I, I know this now as a biologist. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the reality. And as Dan alludes to, it produces a tremendous challenge for us. We are biological machines, just like amoeba are, but we are the only biological machines that can know our machineness. And that produces everything from self-reflection to phenomenal neuroses to like denial to everything else on earth. We're the only ones who are capable of simultaneously saying, wow, that's nice that that person just complimented me on, on the color of my eyes while saying that's completely asinine. I had nothing to do with it. Hmm. Wow. To say, that's a great job that you did that you're now CEO of the company. 
and recognizing at the same time, I was already born on third base. I had all of the, we're a weird, troubled, foibled species for that reason, because we can know our machine this at the same time that we can fall for the palpability with which we feel as if we are captains of our own fate. And what that winds up meaning is, yeah, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to keep that in mind. Keep it in mind for when it really matters, for when you're judging harshly. Okay. So can I ask you, Dan, a similar question? If I've understood your view, I've, I've read several of your books, You, I think what you're saying is you agree with Robert that there's this long, the whole of history of life and then all of your particular life, but I think you're also saying that evolution has created within the machine that you are an ability to judge possibilities and choose between them. So you think that, that there's a part yeah, of the yeah. machine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, that's okay. right. That's and, right. And Robert doesn't think there is that part of the machine. No, no, well, we're in complete agreement there. As part of your machine, you weigh the possibilities and you choose. You generate options through mechanisms that may or may not be dependent on chaoticism, nonlinearity, blah, blah, et cetera. You generate options and yeah, you choose. But that has nothing to do with whether or not there's free will because the choice you make reflects the values, tastes, et cetera, that you had no control over in you becoming the person who you are. It's back to that same thing. Where did that intent come from? But don't you want to take responsibility for your character and your judgment and your political views and your and your moral views? Don't you think that, don't you identify with them? Don't you think, lucky me, lucky me, I'm not responsible for having the free will that I have, but I... I'm happy to say that people can trust me. They can reason with me. They can change my mind. I'm open to discussion. This That's what free will is. It's not indeterminism. It has nothing to do with indeterminism. Any more than evolution has to do with indeterminism. Okay. Which nicely moves us into this moral realm. Don't I want to take responsibility for my actions, my achievements, all of that, isn't that a good thing? That's a terrible thing because we have a world in which we think it is okay to treat some people way better than average, including you and me, because of things we had no control over and to treat other people way worse than average and then to butter them over with crap about this is a just world in which people get what they deserve. If taking responsibility for your achievements, all of that leads you to decide that you're entitled, you've earned to have your needs considered more than that of any other person out there, this, in fact, is a terrible outcome. And we well, run that's... The on that terrible outcome that we feel as if we have earned our rewards and punishments. And if you, and if you got caught um, plagiarizing a scientific paper or fudging data, would you take responsibility for that? Absolutely. In the mechanics. Well, good. So you agree with me. No, it's a absolutely. good thing to take responsibility. In the same way that I can say that right now, I am responsible for the fact that not only is my arm moving, but all the quarks that make up my arm I have cause to move. Yes, yes, we're getting caught up in the agents are things that cause things to happen. Agents do things. Non-agents do not do things. Yes, yes. But this is not the level we're talking about. We're talking about, is this a world where it is okay, not only if you were born in poverty in our wonderfully just nation that you and I share, that you were overwhelmingly likely to remain in poverty in adulthood. If you were born to parents who are upper middle class, you're far more likely to wind up in my classroom at Stanford than in the county prison. All of that, that's the level that we're dealing with. That we Okay, look well, let's deal with it. And I think here we agree. We both think we should do what we can to improve those conditions. 
We should do what we can to eliminate poverty, to eliminate child abuse, to eliminate malnutrition. And if we do that, then more and more people will be able to make the rather minimal criteria for being, you know, responsible enough to have a driver's license. You know, you make a big deal in, in your book of, about the gardener at Stanford, uh, whom, whom you see uh, dutifully uh, uh, trimming up around the edges while, while you're at some commencement ceremony. But I dare say he's an honest man. He's a responsible man. He, you don't know whether, whether he's thrilled to death to be able to, you know, perhaps bring his family from somewhere, you know, in South America where he was in great difficulties. And now he's in the United States. He's got a job. He's taking care of his family. And he's proud to be an honest man. And he's proud to deserve the salary that Stanford pays him. There are lots of people like that. There are people that from every walk of life who prize their self-control and their free will. Can I, can I just, Dan, you were saying, you know, you were saying that you both agreed that we should do something about this, this, these moral questions, but am I right in thinking that you, Dan, think that you have the free will to say, I'm going to do something about this. Whereas if I've understood you, Robert, you're not, you can't say, I'm going to do something about this. The circumstances of, your life and prehistory will either mean that you will do something about it or you won't. But there's you, Robert, are not going to make that choice. You're merely going to observe it. In effect, yes. But okay. maybe more helpful is to frame sort of the things that both Dan and I would like to accomplish. Dan's is an agenda, God help me for saying a word this verboten these days, but of a liberal which is to say it's important to remember the edge cases. Brain damage, okay, keep in mind they're a special case, that sort of thing. But for everybody else, we have a realm in which responsibility makes sense. And I would characterize where I'm coming from as one as far, far more radical. What we see when somebody has brain damage is an easy task for us. We can see the thing that rob them of responsibility. But when we look at everybody else, we have the far harder task of we need to see thousands and thousands of spider web thick cables of the influences that started from the beginning of life until one second ago. And it's a hell of a lot harder to see that. And science has made less progress with that. And it's a whole lot easier to look at that complicated scenario and say, This one is not an exception. This is one where we can hold them responsible. That's the limits of what science has told us constitute edge cases. There are no edge cases. There's just ones where the causality is easier to see because it was mostly from one sledgehammer of an influence rather than a gazillion. But it's the same threads that ultimately bind us. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, continue to have tests for whether somebody is capable of driving on the highway? Oh, of course, absolutely. Even well, then you're going to be making those judgments. One oh, thing, that's one that's, thing, that's fine. I think one, we thing, can, one we, thing you ought to consider, how about asking them? How about asking them whether they want to be held responsible or whether they want to be treated as put them put them in some kind of quarantined lodge and remove from them the capacity to move about in society. I don't, I don't want to do that with people. If they, if, if they want to be out and about and free, I'm all for it. As long as, as they agree to follow the the rules of society, the laws and behave themselves. And, but, are, but are you, Robert, saying well, that it's not a matter of whether they agree or not, whether they were going to agree or not was predetermined? And predetermined and inculcated into them as to whatever their intuitions are about how the world should or shouldn't work and whether they deserve to be in their place or not. Where 
where we're having this difference is yes, absolutely, we should recognize that like it's bad to have murderers running around on the streets. We need to protect people from that. That seems undeniable. And there are ways of doing that without having to invoke a responsibility. And at the same time, we also want to make sure that we have competent people removing your brain tumor than someone randomly chosen off the street. It is possible to create a world in which we protect people from dangerous things without invoking a medieval sense of responsibility and to have competent people doing the difficult things without it being an issue of responsibility and without it being an issue of you are more worthy because you happen to have the skills that allow you to drive a car safely or to take out somebody's glioblastoma. Well, then, well, then we, we have hardly any disagreement, Robert, because you want to get rid of a medieval notion of responsibility. So do I. Okay. So um, do I. Can, can can I um I'll put some questions from the audience to you both? Would that be all right? Um, we have um, Logan Polk Smith asks, why do many people fear that adopting a deterministic worldview will lead to immoral action? And asks, what kind of actual changes would occur if we do believe in a deterministic worldview? Either one of you, Robert, would you like to start? You Sure. This is the thing that worries everyone. We're yeah. going to run amok. <laughs> and there's a small literature showing that if you experimentally manipulate people into believing a little bit less in free will, they're more likely to cheat in an economic game 10 minutes later. One thing worth noting is that those studies have not replicated. But the much more important thing is to note when you take somebody not who's been manipulated into believing less in free will since they came in to get their five dollars for volunteering for this experiment, but somebody who shows up who already does not believe in free will, what the studies show is they are exactly as ethical in their behavior as do people who have thought long and hard and decided we should be held responsible. How does that happen, such opposite poles? Because these are not really opposite poles. In both cases, these are people who have thought long and hard, what are the roots of human goodness? Why are we here? What is the source of meaning, all of that? And if you've done that hard work, much as with the high levels of ethical behavior, whether you look at someone who is highly religious or someone who is very stridently atheistic, you've done the hard work. In both cases, you wind up getting very ethical people. If we have a world in which that's a starting point, the notion of people running amok because there's no responsibility is, is a complete red herring. I don't know. As we have it, we have a world in which most people are inculcated into thinking that there's an omnipotent whoever up there who's going to hold us responsible. And we haven't done a pretty impressive job of being moral amid that. So I think the notion that we're being held for responsibility, I think that's what fuels, Dan, both your and my atheism. Uh, theism does not have a particularly good track record. But nonetheless, no, if you raise people to think that we are the outcome of all that came before, this is not going to be a world in which people run amok. This is a world in which people are going to be more empathic and less blaming for reasons that are totally different from the world we have now, except for the edge cases that you cite. Well, those people will have what I consider free will. Now, we, you, you don't want to admit that uh, you... Uh, you say it isn't free will and responsibility just because on the social level everyone says it is that's the central point of the book that's a quote from you and I I say well that's a point that I really disagree with you on because I think everybody who says they have free will they've got it right because that's what free will really is let me try uh, uh, a simple example on you um, you agree that money is real? Money is real? Sure. Yeah. Dollars are real. Good. Um, doesn't depend on the gold standard, does it? 
Well, insofar as I understand next to nothing about it, sure, I'll, I'll take that off. I mean, people used to think that you couldn't have money unless you had something that was intrinsically economically valuable, like gold or something. No, we now understand money is a, is a brilliant social construction. It's real. People believe in it. Now, there are people who go around and say, no, 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 money is an illusion. There's no such thing as money, really. All there is is neuromodulators and squishy stuff in the brain and, and so forth. But they, that's a very Pickwickian position. When I, when I go to sign a mortgage, as I did recently, the notary public asked me, are you signing this of your own free will? And I said, yes. And I meant what she meant by free will. I'm not being coerced. Nobody's got me under remote control. I'm not being blackmailed. And I've got enough of my wits about me still so that I am legally entitled to sign this document. That's what free will is. It's the philosophers who have inflated that into this bizarre metaphysical contraption of of indeterminism, they're the ones that have foisted, may I say, on you a, a medieval notion of free will, which has long since vanished. Good. We're right back where we started, which is for you, intent and awareness, there's alternatives. All of that is enough to satisfy your definition that you were acting freely there. Let's unpack that. How did you become the sort of person? who would value taking on the financial burden and responsibility of a mortgage rather than spending it all on liquor at the bar? How did you become the sort of person who at your stage of life would decide that ownership of land is a good investment? How did you become the sort of person who decided that you're actually going to do that rather than defraud this bank because you figured out a way to do it? How did you become? How did you become? How did you lucky, I guess. Well, just lucky, but nonetheless, because of things you had no control over. Because that's at this stage, point of luck. you were exactly, and that's the whole point. We are nothing more or less than the sum of the biological luck that has made us and its interactions with the environmental luck which has made us. That's all we are. All we are is what came before, over which we had no control. Once again, the past isn't even past. The past is who we are now. And somehow, you wound up being the sort of person with the values, abilities, self-control, et cetera, to take out a mortgage at this point. Um, can I interrupt for a second? Um, um, uh, it may be that we can ask people to have another poll and see if anyone's changed their mind, see if, <laughs> if the circumstances of their lives mean they were going to. While they're thinking about that, Am I right in thinking, it's just a final question, if you don't mind. It seems to me, if Dan, you would consider that it would be possible for you to choose to change your mind, having listened to Robert. But Robert, would you be able to change your mind, given that the circumstances of your life are the same? You're, it seems to me that you're not going to be able to change your mind. Am I right or have I misunderstood? Yes, I could not choose to change my mind right now. <laughs> Nonetheless, my mind could be changed because I've become the sort of person who could be convinced by a solid argument. I've become the sort of person where I am not thrown into a panicked, right. you know, secure state of admitting that I'm wrong. I'm not the sort of person where out of perversity, I want to do the exact opposite of what I... So there, there is an imbalance here. In other words, Dan can choose to change his mind himself. You, Robert, have to rely on Dan to choose your mind. I do not think Dan can <laughs> choose. <laughs> to, 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 to change your mind. Because he became the sort of person who watching a movie cares about cinematography. <laughs> and the sort of person who watching a movie cares about inspirational, emotional. Because of who we are at this moment, we react to our circumstances in ways which will change us and change us in different ways. We don't choose to change. We are changed by circumstance and by the sort of person circumstances prior to this turned us into. Absolutely. Um, well, I wanna... Sorry, go ahead, Dan. 
I want I want to return to Tom Wolf. He says we're wired. I'm wired wrong, and ask what it would be to be wired right. I think most of us are wired right, not perfectly, but good enough. And the ones that are wired wrong, indeed, they're not responsible. But we get we we deal with the edge cases. That's a delicate and difficult matter, and and where the edges are may change over time. But we've still got a normal population of adult civilized human beings who can be held responsible, who want to be held responsible, and who therefore have, in the sense that matters, free will. And one could respond to the want to be held responsible with all sorts of sound bites along the lines of loving their chains. We're not trying to explain the brains that are wrong. We're trying to explain all the brains. And this applies just as much. The brains that are wrong are the easier ones for us to figure out because, yeah, this person, fetal alcohol syndrome or abused as a child. Yeah, those are the easy ones. And that's the liberals edge case version of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's remember those are the exceptions. They aren't exceptions. That's just the different domain of us trying to figure out how we became who we are and out of circumstances we had no control over. Um, well, what I can tell you is that the circumstance which the viewers, listeners had no control over, listening <laughs> to the pair of you, uh, is that now 49% still believe in free will um, and 61% have decided that it's all been determined for them by listening to the pair of you. Wait, 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 watch it there, fella. 49 and 61 don't add up. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. Click me there. You're right. But it, I was told that there's been a 10% swing towards determinism. Sorry if I got the numbers wrong. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry, 39% and 50 and 61%. So I'm not sure if that's because they all thought this for themselves or that, um, you know, circumstances change, but that's how it has happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, we, there's, a, there's a million other questions come in um, and we don't have time. Um, but Dan, Robert, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. I'm not sure that anyone will have changed their mind or, or understand why they changed their mind if they did. But um, uh, it was great listening to the pair of you. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great. Been well, good talking with you, Robert. Likewise, this was totally fun. So thank you for this happening. Thank you both.